morning and welcome to all of you who are worshiping with us today. The Lenten season officially begins this Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. Many Christians observe Ash Wednesday with the imposition of ashes. Ashes are mixed with olive oil and painted on the worshiper's head, the sign of the cross. As both church Lutherans, that is not our tradition, at the base of the pulpit, there is a glass jar of wood ashes that approximates what we are if we were turned into ashes. Five pounds of ashes, three quarts in volume, is about the average for an adult. Our observance of Ash Wednesday brings to our attention, dust thou art and to dust thou shall return. Ashes are a sign of repentance. Matthew records in chapter 11, Then Jesus began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, Gentile cities, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth, and ashes. As we enter the holy season of Lent, may ours be a heart of repentance, recalling the Lenten hymn, It was my sins for which thou, Lord, must languish. We'll be following the order of service printed out for you. The opening hymn is number 98, Jesus, I Will Ponder Not.
join in the confession of sins. In the name of our God, to whom all hearts are open, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Amen. Amen. I confess that I am by nature sinful. I am guilty of many sins. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me. For all this I am sorry. I pray for forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Jesus says to his people, If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for Psalm 51, page 86. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. We join in the psalm prayer. Lord, we confess our sins to you and plead for your mercy. We acknowledge that sin runs too deep in our nature to rid ourselves of it. But we thank you that Jesus has done what we could not do, washing us clean of every stain. <coughs> we plead that your Spirit would give us the strength to live a new life through Christ our Lord. Amen. The first portion of the Passion History is titled, In the Upper Room. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread was approaching, and the chief priests and teachers of the law were looking for some way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. Jesus said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to ask him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that being John, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast, or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, then God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them are given the title benefactor. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? 
Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We continue our worship with hymn number 106. <clears throat> said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust. Accusations are a powerful thing. I think probably all of us have been accused of something that we didn't do. Accusations are so powerful that even if they are not true, they can damage our reputations. They can damage relationships. Accusations can bring down world leaders. They can destroy trust marriage. 
A man named Job knew the crushing power of accusations. Job's suffering is legendary. He lost all his oxen, sheep, donkeys, camels, and even the servants who were taking <coughs> care of him. He lost them all of a sudden. 10,000 casualties. All his wealth was wiped out with that catastrophe. He lost his income, he lost his life savings, and he lost his retirement fund. All was gone. And that wasn't the worst of it. His seven sons and three daughters were eating a meal together and the house collapsed on them and they all died. Job lost nearly everything and everyone he held dear to himself. If you were Job, what would you do? What would you say? Job tore his robes, he shaved his head. He was in mourning. Then he fell to the ground and he worshiped. And he uttered those well-known words, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Job was devastated. Yet scripture tells us in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Job's ordeal wasn't over. Next, he was afflicted with boils from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. He was in agony. It hurt to sit. And with that chronic pain, it would have been almost impossible to sleep. The only relief that Job got was to take a piece of broken pottery and scrap, uh, scrape and scratch the boils. His wife's advice, Job, curse God and die. It's not worth living anymore. But Job didn't curse God. Instead, Job said, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Several of Job's friends came to visit him. At first, they just sat with him in silence. And sometimes that's the best thing that we can do as friends, to just be there for someone, not offer any words, just to be there. But this was the only thing that Job's friends did that was good. When they opened their mouths, everything went downhill. They tried to rationalize Job's suffering. They, the only explanation that made sense to them was that Job had done something secretly that was wrong. He had something that he did that deserved this. This wouldn't have happened to a righteous person. What sin are you hiding, Job? Their attempt at comforting quickly turned to accusation. What did you do? Maybe their accusation resonated with something that Job was already wondering about in his own mind. He finally cried out to God, If I have sinned, what have I done to you? You who see everything we do, why have you made me your target? Giving in to despair, God was being put on trial by Job. Job was insinuating that God was unjust, uncaring, a bully, making Job's life miserable. But here's where Job had crossed the line. Over the next weeks, we'll see how people put God on trial. We'll hear how Caiaphas and Herod, Pilate, and the angry crowds accused the Son of God. But we must consider how we too have done the same thing. We put God on trial from time to time, don't we? 
We may not say it aloud, but there are accusations and there are questions. Lord, why did you take my loved one away from me? Lord, why must this relationship become so hard? Lord, what did I do to deserve this? Lord, why have I been sick for so long? Lord, I'm tired. I'm worn out. Why me? Why are you, Lord, doing this to me? In our impatience and frustrations, complaining and criticism, we too have crossed the line. Our questions actually become charges against God. We're calling God on the stand to defend himself. Now listen to what God said to Job. After allowing Job and his friends to do all the talking through 38 chapters of the book of Job, God confronts his suffering servant. God says, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. God is saying, Job, I'll ask the questions. Where were you when I formed the universe? Job, where were you when I put boundaries on the seas and hung the stars in their places? Job, where were you? Who is it that brings rain and snow and lightning? Job was brought back to his senses. He said, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. I repent in dust and ashes. God put Job in his place, a place of repentance. God calls us to repentance too, doesn't he? He does that through Christian friends and family and especially through his word. He calls us to repentance because he does not want us to lose our faith and our hope of salvation. Throughout Job's ordeal, though he sinned by putting God on trial, bringing accusations against God, Job never lost his faith. In the very middle of the book of Job, we hear him cry out with the faith of Easter joy, those familiar Easter words, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Job, in all his troubles, clung to the hope of a Redeemer. And you and I know that Redeemer by name, the Lord Jesus Christ. During this Lenten season, we are again going to see our Redeemer as he stands on the trial for being a sinner. He stands on trial in front of sinners, betrayed by a close follower, arrested by a mob, he's put on trial, accused and charged, his accusers spit him in the face and call for his death. And Jesus will just stand there and take it. He won't be like Job. Jesus will not cry out in anger or accuse God. Even though Jesus is innocent, he will not complain. This is why Jesus came. He came to take accusation of sin on himself, to undo the accusation that Satan brings against you and me. On his cross, Jesus gave his life for all sins that we have committed against God. When you suffer, when the pain doesn't go away, remember how God took on flesh in order to take our accusations on himself. Since the accusations of a world full of sin fell on Jesus, not one accusation by Satan God's eyes, the accusations have been put on his son and there's nothing to be put on us. There is no need to despair in our trouble. No need to accuse. 
We don't need to even understand why troubles come into our lives. Because we know God knows. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let us rise and pray. O God, our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely from light to darkness and again to light. The grace into your hands are unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only by you us will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. retaliate. In fact, while on the cross, you prayed for those who nailed you there. Implant in our hearts the virtues of gentleness and patience, so that we may overcome evil with good, that we may, for your sake, love our enemies, and as children of the Heavenly Father, seek peace and rejoice in your love. We close with you 
thank you to Bonnie and Lina for taking care of both of us. Yes, take note. It's a new bulletin board, the first in a long time. Maybe he lasts for a long time. <laughs> That's up to the committee. That's up to the committee. You have a vast repertoire. <laughs> I just want to mention my people, the trade show, the registration and gift of incentive uh, that's being taken care of. Uh, we have these trifles that we can hand out. We've got an easy sign to carry to sit around the corner by the, behind the bowling ball. And things like that are set out. Uh, DVDs, we've got, do we have uh, books yet on, on food? Um, all these types of things, when these people signed up, there are all ladies. Lots of covered. The more the merrier. And since that's coming up, uh, keep in mind in your plans. March 2nd. March 2nd, oh yes. At the high school. At the, thank you. At the high school. And uh, of course, it is the end of the restaurant week in Custer. So there's nothing preventing you from also signing up and going out to eat before or after or both. <laughs>